In today's episode, we're going over physical therapy treatment for tennis elbow. Let's get after it. First and foremost, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. My name is Dan Pope a physical therapist, coach, personal trainer, and meathead. I love all things fitness. This is the Fitness Pain-Free Show, where we help coaches and physical therapists like you get your patients out of pain and back to train in the gym. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button, leave me a comment, and subscribe to the channel. If you're watching this on a podcast version, yes, there is a video podcast, but also you can listen to it as well, uh, please leave me a positive rating and review. It helps a ton. If you want to go that extra step and support the channel further, please consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. Think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists, get premium content from me, Dan Pope. It's like the content you have on these podcasts, but it goes a little bit more in depth. It's updated monthly. I've been doing this for the past five years or so. There's about 100 webinars, eBooks, and complete guides there. You also get access to a private Facebook group to have any questions answered by me. You can also decide upcoming podcast topics. So if anything is burning that you want to learn about, let me know. I can help you out, right? You can also get started for just $1. It is a recurring monthly subscription, but it's only $12.99 per month. If you sign up, you can also just get rid of it right away. You won't make me upset. I'll be a little upset, but not that upset, okay? Uh, so if you want to support me, head over to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and then click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library. I'll also put a link in the show notes so you can check that out. Okay, so... I want to go over a physical therapy evaluation with a diagnosis and the treatment, as well as my entire plan of care, and then how we discharge at the very end for someone with tennis elbow. Okay. So who are we working with today? Uh, so this is an older patient of mine. It's a 51 year old male. Okay. Uh, he's a big fan of weight trading, cardio, and tennis. Tennis is a big thing. He really loves uh, fitting, right? He's a tennis player and he's got a tennis elbow. Um, yeah, so he's very fit and very active and a recreational tennis player. He plays a little bit competitively, uh, but not at a very high level. He really just loves to do it. Right. So he hurt himself about six weeks ago. Uh, he had a very tough forehand uh, and initially it wasn't that bad and it really just got worse over the course of time. Uh, so it wasn't really a gradual onset. There wasn't incidents, but it really started minor and just kind of got worse over the course of time. Right. So eventually tennis serves were the worst, right? It used to be forehands, then it turned into tennis, right? And over the course of time, he was having trouble in the gym. So he couldn't do curls. He stopped doing curls, took that out. He took out his, um, his initial arm work with his triceps. That was bothering him as well. Eventually he wasn't able to grip much. Uh, and over the course of time, it hurt to like, you know, shake hands. He's a lawyer. So he has to be able to shake hands and show confidence in his, you know, people he's working with. So he wasn't able to do that. And that was a, a bit of a problem, right? So what kind of psychosocial stuff do we pick up in the evaluation? Uh, so for one, he's he's depressed, right? Um, and you're, you always have this chicken or the egg. Did the pain lead to the depression or vice versa? I think it was the latter. So basically, after he had pain, he's just sad. And he's not able to exercise the way he wants to. So this is a bit of a problem for him, right? It's going to affect his training greatly. He has a hard time with any sort of gripping. He has trouble with arm work. And that's, that's really tough for him because he loves weight training. The other part is that he works with a tennis pro one time per week, and he's really had to modify that greatly. He also doesn't know how to navigate that, which is something we will talk about a bit later about what he's able to do and he's, what he's not able to do in order to respect the uh, the elbow, but to get new training over the course of time, right? And the other piece is he plays competitively twice per week. Um, you know, and that might not sound like much, but I think it, it, that does provide social pressure for him to go out and play tennis. Uh, and one of the problems is that if he continues kind of pushing through this pain, it may get better over the course of time, and it might get worse, and it's currently getting worse, right? So think about it. This person really wants to compete. They love doing it. When they can't do it, they're depressed. So from a psychosocial perspective, he's going to want to continue pushing despite the pain. So that's just something we have to troubleshoot, which we end up doing. Uh, so we end up allowing him to continue exercising, so we address some of these psychosocial factors um, without irritating the area and, and getting him out of pain over the course of time, right? So how about med medical providers? Did he see any doctors yet? Well, he did see one physician. Uh, and the physician recommended total rest, right? Which actually did help a bit. Um, and it can help a lot of folks. But when he tried to get back to exercise, it started hurting again. So when we go down that whole pathway of, is this a true tendonitis? So in folks that have a true tendonitis, if you rest, the inflammation should go down. And then when you go back to exercise, it should be fine. Uh, that wasn't the case here, which leads me to believe this is really truly more of a tendinosis, lateral epicondylalgia, right? Not a true tendonitis, which is probably much more rare than the osis condition, right? And then I had a prior patient of mine uh, that recommended uh, this current patient work with me. So that's always nice when you have a, a patient referral, because I always say it's like, um, 
it's like someone setting a golf ball up on the tee for you to take it and, and just smash that ball, right? Uh, if the person believes that you're a good PT from one of their friends, that's going to help you with your patient outcomes, right? So what other kind of information do we have from a psychosocial standpoint that's going to guide us, right? So he's motivated, but he's also a busy person. Like I said, he's a lawyer, and I don't know much about that profession, but I know that they're very busy based on talking to my patient. And the other part is that there's periods of time where they're preparing for certain trials, and they get uber busy, right? And that's going to be really important because if I give him this huge program that has him working out seven times a week, he might not be able to get any of that done, right? So I might be destining him for failure if I don't take this into account, right? The other piece is he's, he's motivated. So he really wants to exercise. So in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, I can, I can rely on him to actually exercise. He probably doesn't need to be in the clinic as frequently because I know he's going to exercise, but I can't give him that much because I don't want to sink the boat for him. All right. The priority for this injury is quite high, right? He loves exercise. He loves fitness right now. He's depressed because he can't do the things that he loves. So he's probably going to end up doing the exercise. Like I said previously, right? Um, he has said to me, and this is, this is great. I love hearing this. He's had prior physical therapy and he has had a lot of success with prior treatments, right? Uh, he, he labeled himself as a good responder, uh, which is phenomenal because he believes in physical therapy. I believe in physical therapy. If those positive beliefs come together, I think that's going to improve our outcomes, right? And that's a great thing, right? And lastly, I always like to ask questions about the patient's goals. So largely this patient really just wanted to get out of pain. That was super important for him. And the other piece is he wants to get back to fitness, right? Wants to be able to exercise, wants to make sure he's not hurting himself further, wants to make sure that this doesn't pop up again in the future once he's out of pain and back to his activities, right? So once we finish up with our uh, subjective, kind of that, uh, that history taking portion of the exam, what do we find from an objective perspective, right? So we looked at his strength, right? And as soon as you start looking at his strength, it, it does start to smell more and more like a tennis elbow. And the first thing that gives that away is that he has pain when he's gripping. Okay, so when he tries to shake my hand, so I have my patient try to grab my hand and squeeze it, right? You can also use a handheld dynamometer, which is a great test to see if there's any sort of weakness and pain. And he's got uh, pain right over the lateral epicondyle of the elbow, right? So pain right on the outside of the elbow right here with gripping activities. Okay, he also had pain with resisted wrist extension, which all of those wrist extensor muscles are going to tug on the lateral epicondyle right where that painful tendon is, right? He also had painful resisted middle finger extension, which is supposed to be a test for ECRB or extensor carpi radialis brevis. Around 95% of all tennis elbow cases are going to be that muscle and tendon. That's going to be the major involvement. And then the other piece is that I assessed his shoulder strength, uh, but really I didn't do any great measuring with a dynamometer to figure out exactly where it is. You will find a bit of research in folks that have tennis elbow that if they are weak in shoulder, abduction, internal rotation, external rotation, and also the trap musculature that helps to kind of rule in um, tennis elbow. And it's also will show you the specific deficits. And if you train those muscles and movements, it tends to enhance your outcomes uh, if you combine that with a little bit of strength for the wrist extensors. Okay. So we noticed there was a little bit of weakness there. Um, I didn't get some great numbers on that, but it was painful with the gripping, painful with the resisted extension, and then a little bit weak at the shoulder, right? And lastly, we looked at range of motion at the shoulder, the elbow, as well as the wrist. And he had pain with end range wrist flexion, which is basically a Mills test. We'll talk about that in a second. And he also had limited overhead range of motion. Now, this research is more in baseball players, and it's also in the UCL. Uh, but if you have a limited overhead range of motion, it will put a bit more stress on the UCL. It will correlate with people who have more Tommy John injuries over the course of time. This is obviously not the same type of injury, but we want to make sure that we improve the range of motion problems that we see. Tennis is a very overhead activity, right? Uh, we want to make sure we have range of motion in all the joints above and below to make sure all those parts can do their job appropriately over the course of time so that load is shared and we don't overload the wrist extensors and continue having tennis elbow over the course of time. When we start looking at regional interdependence, so basically how about the other joints above and below the elbow, what do they look like, right? Because, like I said previously, if they're weak or they don't have the range of motion they need, that can increase stress on the lateral elbow. So he has a little bit of cross body stiffness. So from a serve perspective, I think he, he needs that range of motion in order to decelerate his arm as well as his racket. If he doesn't have that range of motion, he might be doing more of that deceleration with the wrist and putting more stress on the elbow, right? He also has some thoracic spine extension and rotation deficits. Again, if I can't get my thoracic spine to extend, rotate, right, as well as flex when you're following through, then I'm not going to be able to utilize the musculature in my upper back to decelerate my arm in that racket. 
it's probably going to put a little extra stress on my lateral elbow. Okay. And lastly, I had to look at his range of motion at 90 degrees of shoulder abduction, internal rotation versus external rotation. And he actually was very limited with shoulder internal rotation. And you would be quick to label that as a GERD, glenohumeral internal rotation deficit, and start to hammer on that range of motion. However, he had a ton of external rotation. So when you add up the internal rotation, the external rotation range of motion, that's called the total arc of motion. We used to think that if you're limited in internal rotation and you're an overhead athlete, that was a risk factor for injury. However, over the course of time, we found that if you have a limited total arc of motion, and that's internal plus external rotation, then you're more at risk, right? So this gentleman had terrible internal rotation, but phenomenal external rotation. And his total arc was around 170 degrees, right? And his contralateral arms, the opposite arm, was about the same. So I really wasn't too concerned about rotation range of motion. And I was more concerned about that horizontal abduction and flexion range of motion over the course of time. If we take a look down the chain a little more, look at the hips, he had a decreased internal and external rotation range of motion at the hips. Uh, so if I'm limited with rotation in my hips, then I'm probably going to have a little trouble controlling motion from that joint, and it may put some stress up the chain more at the elbow. So we addressed it, right? Um, I don't think that uh, if you left some of that treatment out, so if I didn't work on my hip rotation range of motion, I think my patient would probably still get better at the end of the day. I just like to be as comprehensive as I possibly can. Uh, hopefully that improves the outcomes over the course of time for my patients. So did this patient have any imaging? No, there was no imaging. And I got to be honest, I don't think you need to have any imaging. Uh, if he wasn't getting better over the course of time, then, then maybe, right? Uh, but to be honest, for most folks to have tennis elbow, it's not the first thing you should think about. If anything, we don't, we don't want to push for imaging, all right? Because we probably don't need it. In terms of palpation, he did have quite a bit of tenderness on the lateral epicondyle, and he also had a little tenderness to the wrist extensors as well. And running through a few special tests that I like to use for tennis elbow, there is a positive Cosens test, which is basically pain with the resisted wrist extension. Uh, I'll put a video up that you can click on to, excuse me, click on here. So if you want to see what a Cosens test is, you can click on this link. He also had pain with gripping, right? So just making uh, a hand fist and squeezing it and also shaking a hand and squeezing our handheld dynamometer was painful. Mills test was also positive. If you want to see that uh, special test, put the link up here. So you can go ahead and click on that, uh, which is basically a wrist extensor stretch. Okay. And lastly, he had pain with a resisted middle finger extension, which is supposed to rule in extensor carpi radialis brevis. Okay. So I'm already thinking this is tennis elbow. But the other thing that's very important is I want to rule out other forms of lateral elbow pain because there might be a different type of treatment, right? Or maybe more serious pathology that we have to look into over the course of time. So what structures lie on the lateral elbow that we have to start thinking about to see if they're involved with this patient's injury? So one is going to be the radial nerve. So once I start doing some neural tension tests for the nerves of the upper extremity, as well as radial nerve, they're all negative. I don't think he's dealing with a nerve issue. There's no numbness, no tingling. Um, I don't think that that's what's going on. I also like to try to rule out any type of cervical involvement. So that could be some sort of brachial plexopathy. That could be some sort of cervical radiculopathy. His range of motion was fine. Plexopathy tests were fine. Neural tension tests were fine. I don't think he was dealing with a neck injury, right? And the other piece is that I, I looked at the shoulder. Like I said, there was, there was limited range of motion, maybe a little bit of weakness issue, but I don't think that he had any pain or issue from the shoulder that was referring down to the elbow, right? So the diagnosis was tennis elbow or lateral epicondylalgia. So what's our decision making at this point? Because sometimes after you finish up a physical therapy evaluation, it's not just next step treatment. It's a, okay, maybe you need to go see another provider. Uh, in this case, I think physical therapy is definitely the way to go. So the physician already recommended physical therapy. He said he's had a positive experience in the past. And we know these things tend to result, resolve pretty well with physical therapy. So it's a no brainer. We should probably continue treating this individual, right? The other piece about ten, tennis elbow is that it generally will resolve naturally over the course of time. And this is one of the things I like to educate my patients about, because let's say they don't want to do physical therapy at all. There's a chance it's just going to go away. So probably about 80% of cases at the one year mark will resolve regardless of what you do. So wait and see does tend to work for most of these folks, right? But the other piece is that if you do some exercise, you get better faster than wait and see, right? So this patient was actually getting worse over the course of time. They're not getting better, right? And they want to get better fast. So I think physical therapy is definitely the right choice for him, right? But I mean, honestly, if he didn't want to do physical therapy, he probably could have just stopped 
right? Left, went out the door and then stopped tennis for a bit and hopefully got back to tennis slowly the course of time and he would have gotten better. Uh, but he's, he's already tried that. So he, that's not probably the best option for him, right? So if he's not making progress over the course of time and, and he did, so he didn't need to do any of this, um, he could look into, let's say, some braces for the area, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, maybe some orthobiologics. And then for the folks that really don't do well at about the year mark or so, or even later, and they've tried everything, they maybe consider surgery, but this is definitely not on the table right now. I really think this individual has a lot of time and effort before they go down that route, right? So we're going to start with physical therapy. Okay. So what's our plan of care? What are we going to do from a treatment perspective? So first and foremost, we want to try to restore range of motion at all the areas that were limited, right? So we were limited with shoulder flexion, overhead motion. Obviously, we're going to need that for tennis. We were limited with thoracic spine motion. So that's going to be with extension as well as rotation, obviously needed for serving in tennis. That's one of the primary things that bugs him. He was limited with hip rotation range of motion. I would like to get that better over the course of time, improve his movement quality. And lastly, he was limited with wrist flexion motion. And really that's just because it hurt. So over the course of time, I think as we get pain to go down, that's going to get better, right? Next step, we're going to restore and build the strength around the entire body, not just at the wrist extensors, but definitely at the wrist extensors, right? Uh, we are going to have to temporarily eliminate aggravating activities, both in the gym, as well as on the tennis court. We want to strengthen the wrist extensors. We want to strengthen the grip as well as the shoulder. We have a bit of research to show that if you add shoulder strengthening to wrist exercises, it improves your outcomes. So why not throw it in there? Plus, he wants to get back to tennis, which obviously you need to have a lot of shoulder strength over the course of time to do well, as well as prevent shoulder and elbow injuries. So I would say let's go for it, right? We're going to progressively challenge the wrist extensors and the elbow over the course of time with heavier weights, more dynamic movements, that type of thing. We'll talk about that a bit more. And then we want a gradual return to training and tennis over the course of time as the patient starts to feel better, right? And I started off physical therapy one time a week for this individual. Uh, a, they're busy, right? So I want to, I don't know that they'd be able to do multiple times per week, nor they necessarily need physical therapy multiple times per week. Um, they're motivated, so they can probably do exercises on their own. So again, I don't think they need multiple visits. And over the course of time, as they progress, we stopped... Uh, we, we decreased the frequency of visits. We had some more space um, between sessions and they naturally got better over the course of time, as you'll see. So first and foremost, uh, we want to make sure that we modify aggravating activities, right? And the things that hurt initially were gripping activities. So in the gym, we temporarily modified gripping. Um, we temporarily modified rowing uh, and pull down activities because those were probably the most painful, right? Somewhat for a grip, excuse me, from a grip perspective, holding onto dumbbells didn't feel phenomenal for things like lunges and step ups. So all we did was put a barbell on his back. And from that perspective, he can still really work his lower body without aggravating his elbow. Right. I also find with folks that have tennis elbow as well as golfer's elbow, if you use a strap, when you hook onto a dumbbell, it's going to make that gripping a little bit easier. So you can lightly grip a heavy dumbbell and still get some good upper back work, which is something we did modification wise early on in this patient's care. The other thing is that we utilize a strap for uh, rowing. Now, if you're watching this uh, on YouTube, the video podcast, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about because I have a picture of this. All right, let me bring this up right here. So we utilized a strap and you put your hand through the strap and the strap goes around your wrist, right? And what happens is that the weight is going to be uh, resting on the wrist joint and you don't have to rely on your grip to hold on to a given weight. In this case, we had the strap attached to a cable. So we could do is rows from that perspective. And what's kind of nice is that <clears throat> he was able to con continue training any sort of rolling or excuse me, rowing or pulling, pull down, dumbbell, single arm row, cable rows, all that stuff. He could still do if he used a strap either around his wrist attached to the dumbbell or a strap around his wrist attached to a cable stack, right? So it worked out really well. Okay. So the next thing we had to modify over the course of time was tennis, right? Uh, just because tennis was aggravating for him. And if we kept on pushing through pain, there's a chance it gets worse over the course of time. And we just don't want that. Right. So initially we had to get rid of powerful forehands, right? Which over the course of time, that got better pretty quick. We'll talk about that a bit later. We had to pull out serving and we also had, also had to pull out competitive play, uh, which really stinks because this is something that uh, the patient really, really liked. However, this is getting worse over the course of time. He wasn't able to continue playing without, you know, irritating the elbow further. So we temporarily got rid of it. Stage two, we started loading the area. Uh, what did that look like? So we did strengthening for the area. 
we kept the session somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes. Like I said, it's a busy guy. Would I like to build a more robust uh, program? Yeah, I would. However, I don't think he's going to do it if I give him too much. And, you know, quite frankly, in the first one or two visits, he's like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to be able to handle the stuff I've given you. So we had to back off a little bit. Okay. So we did strength three times a week. Uh, the reason why I pick three times a week is because most of the research I see in not just the, the lateral elbow, but in other areas of the body, usually folks are doing some sort of physical therapy intervention two to three times a week with a home exercise program to do on your off days, right? So that's the reason why I personally do three times a week. I'm not saying that's perfect. You may need to change it over the course of time, but it's typically where I start, <clears throat> okay? We were targeting the wrist with specific focus on wrist extension, as well as pronation control of the forearm, just because when you swing a tennis racket, when you serve with a tennis racket, after you make contact with the ball, you have to slow down that racket from overhead all the way down, which is gonna put a ton of stress on the wrist extensors, but it's also um, putting a lot of stress on pronation or supination of the forearm. So the racket is going to try to pronate your forearm and the musculature in the forearm has to be able to resist this motion and hopefully not aggravate the uh, musculature in the forearm of the course time. So we need pronation control. And as you'll see, we targeted that in our home exercise program. And the last piece that we did some shoulder strengthening. Okay. And this started pretty basic and just advanced over the course of time to be more specific. Right. I also want to make sure that there's some total body strength training in the mix. Uh, what was kind of nice is he's already working with a trainer, personal trainer, one time per week. And the trainer's pretty good. So I'm able to communicate with the trainer and make sure that they're just hitting all of the, uh, the places I think are important for his rehab and also for fitness in the future. So he did a lot of lunges, multi-planar lunges, squats, deadlifts. And he also worked on core rotation, which I think is another very, very important part um, and specific task for uh, tennis, which is great. So the trainer was actually covering a lot of the rehab type stuff that I'd like to do that he doesn't have time for. So worked out perfectly. What did the home exercise program look like? So let me bring this program up so you can actually see it a bit better. So we did the same thing three times per week. Now you could definitely make an argument that um, you could make this a little bit more robust and change it up. Like I said, my patient didn't have a lot of time for fanciness, right? Uh, so I just gave him something that was basic and easy and it got the job done over the course of time for a, for, excuse me, from a mobility perspective, we were doing mobility work three to five times per week. So we're focusing on the musculature on the backside of the shoulder blade. So infraspinatus teres minor, those are going to limit cross body mobility, foam roll that for about 60 seconds, followed by a cross body stretch to try to improve that range of motion. After that, we were doing extensions, thoracic spine extensions over a foam roller for sets of 10 and following that up by sideline thoracic rotations. So we're working on shoulder cross body range of motion and we're working on thoracic spine extension and rotation. Okay. After that, we followed up by some quadruped thoracic extensions or extension rotations. And then the last thing we did was I called a standing hip twister. So basically you stand in front of a table, you bend over like you're in a golfing position, holding on to the table and then turning the hips left and right as far as you can to try to improve hip rotation mobility. Okay. From a strength perspective, we were doing dumbbell scaption sideline dumbbell external rotation, dumbbell resisted supination. So working on pronation control, we're doing dumbbell bicep curls, but here's the kicker. We started with the palm up. So concentrically palm up. And then once we get to full elbow flexion, we twist and we come down with the palm facing down. So on the way down from your curl, we have the palm facing down. So it's an isometric contraction of the wrist extensors. Okay. So it's going to be more of the wrist flexors on the way up. And then we flip the dumbbell and it's going to be more of the wrist extensors on the way down, which I love that exercise. I think it's phenomenal because we're getting that isometric contraction of the wrist extensors with elbow extension, right? And that's phenomenal. And last piece is we did a dumbbell T to work some of the scapular stabilizers. All right. So that's a program we started with. What did we do in the clinic? Okay. So when this patient came in, I generally start most of my sessions with manual therapy in follow-up visits. Okay. That's not always the case, but that's what we did for this patient. Okay. What did that consist of? So we did some soft tissue work to the wrist extensors. That was some massage work with my hands. That was work with some tools. Okay. So gua sha, um, instrument assisted, soft tissue mobility, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it, as well as some dry needling to the wrist extensors. Right. We also did a high powered laser to the lateral epicondyle, hopefully speed up some healing in that area. I also like to do some mobilizations with movement. If you guys want to see a video of that manual technique, you can go ahead and click up here. I'll put a video there, right? 
I also like to do some type of thoracic manipulation in these folks, um, probably because we are desensitizing the central nervous system, right? We're probably having a systemic effect, which is going to reduce some pain uh, with their gripping, but hopefully across the entire body and make them feel a little bit better so they can exercise better. And I was also doing some soft tissue mobility for the lats because he's limited with overhead mobility. Um, I know a lot of people will poo-poo on soft tissue techniques, but if you would test before and after overhead mobility <clears throat> from someone who has stiffness and overhead motion, after you do maybe a minute or two of soft tissue mobility for the lats, Terry's major, that cleans up really, really fast, right? So I think it's a pretty effective treatment to just give it a go with your patients with limited overhead, but you got to follow it up with some sort of active stretch or some sort of activity at home so they can make sure they get that long-term improvement, right? Um, you can also make the argument that these folks don't need manual therapies whatsoever. If you choose not to do manual therapies, that's probably fine. Will we get a better short-term uh, relief? I believe so. And some folks, maybe not in all. So if people are not getting the benefit to this or they're strapped for time, then you can skip it. Okay. I'm fine with that. This is just how I choose to treat my patients. All right. Next thing we worked on is rhythmic stabilization and strength. Uh, one of the big things that I like to do is to work on techniques and strategies that patients can't do on their own right? So they can't do the manual therapy well on their own, and they can't do some of these rhythmic stabilizations on their own. So we do this while they're in the clinic, all right? And then we update their program. And when they go home, they can do most of the exercise on their own, okay? If they're not good at doing the exercise on their own, if they need that extra motivation, yeah, they can come to the clinic, and I'm going to help them through that, right? Or if they need some help with their technique, then yeah, I'm going to bring them to the clinic, and I'm going to try to coach them up a little bit. But if they can do this stuff on their own, I want to put that locus of control into their hands. The activities they can do on their own that's going to help them get better without my help is what I want them to do on their own, right? We're trying to change that locus of control, give the patient the ability to change their own pain, okay? That's what we want. So in terms of what rhythmic stabilizations we use, um, so basically, if you don't know what a rhythmic stabilization is, it's typically we have a patient do some sort of exercise for the shoulder, let's say, sideline dumbbell external rotation. We give them manual resistance, so I am pushing on their hand as they push out, right, into external rotation. We usually pause, and then I try to wiggle their arm around, and my cue is to don't let me move you. So I'm going to move their shoulder around, their hand around, and they're trying to stay in place. And the idea is we're trying to improve dynamic control of the shoulder. Okay. So we do a lot of these different ones. We make it specific to um, throwing, right? Or just basically overhead athletes. This, this guy's obviously a tennis player. So I think it's very specific to him. So we do a lot of work for the shoulder, for the rotator cuff. We work on the scapular stabilizers and we work on the wrist. So we do resisted um, supination, we work on pronation control, we do wrist extension work, uh, we work on some plyos, so some ball throws against the wall. All that stuff was in the clinic. And initially, we start off with 60 minute sessions. And as that patient gets better from a pain perspective, and also as they get better at going through the treatments quickly, then we just break it down, we take it a little bit faster, and we just we get it all done in the 30 minute session over the course of time. So we start off with 60 minute session, and we work our way to 30 minute sessions. And eventually, we have a decreased frequency of visits. Okay, how do we progress the treatment program over the course of time? Okay. So we work on increasing the challenge to the wrist extensors and really the entire body. So early on in rehab, you might be doing more isometric work just because isometrics are not as challenging on the tendon as isotonics, right? So working the concentric and the eccentric together, a little more challenging for that tendon. Um, as you are getting better, maybe you incorporate more eccentrics and concentrics, also known as um, iso isotonics when you put the two together. Okay. We're going to work uh, slow at first. So maybe we have a bit of a tempo when we're doing wrist extension, slow and controlled. And over the course of time, we have to work on moving more quickly because you have to decelerate a tennis racket very quickly for lots of repetitions over the course of time. So we're going to need that um, ability to handle those speeds over the course of time. We start with lighter loads and we progress to heavier loads, right? So when patients first start their physical therapy exercises, Often, I don't even call the exercises strengthening exercises. And the reason being is because it doesn't feel to the patient like they're getting strength, okay? They have enough pain that when they do the exercise, it just feels like it hurts the area, right? And I often tell patients this is good, right? I tell them that we're putting the medicine in the right area. It means that the exercise is doing its trick. It's healing your injury, okay? But if you go too heavy, that can cause more irritation than we want, right? So oftentimes in the beginning of rehab, we're going slow, we're doing these exercises to tolerance. So I tell the patients, I want these exercises to be minimally painful and very tolerable. And if they're not, we decrease the load. Okay. So the, lo the loads have to be pretty light in the beginning. And over the course of time, we just start bumping it up, 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 up. Everything gets a little bit heavier. Okay. 
And then over the course of time, we incorporated harder gripping activities. So we started to incorporate more dumbbell exercise in the gym with lunges, step ups, and also with deadlifts and the like, right? So we basically took away some of the things we're aggravating, <clears throat> started with really light loads, and then we started to progress heavier over the course of time as people or as this individual is able to tolerate harder exercises, right? How about the shoulder strength? So yeah, we want to make the exercises for the shoulder a little bit harder over the course of time as well. Uh, like I said, initially we weren't able to grip well, it was painful for gripping. So we added a strap, um, we attached that to a cable or attached that to a dumbbell and that was able to decrease some of the stress on the elbow over the course of time. We just incorporated the regular rowing exercise as a grip improved over the course of time. The other thing we started to do is make the shoulder exercises more specific to tennis, right? So if you think about a tennis serve, it's actually pretty similar to a dumbbell Y exercise. So if I lay on my stomach with my arm off the edge and I have a dumbbell in my hand and I bring my arm overhead in a Y pattern, that's pretty similar to the follow through of a tennis serve. Okay. We also started to do more cross body cable work. Why? Because we want to get better at rotating with the core and working the shoulder simultaneously. Right. And our, External rotation work also became a little more specific because we started to get that elbow a little bit higher into the 90-90 position. So we went from a sideline dumbbell external rotation to a 90-90 external rotation. So basically, we're making the rotator cuff exercises more challenging, and we're getting the more arm more overhead so we can handle things like a serve in tennis, okay? So how long did it take to return back to sport and other activities that were painful? So Big thing is that when you start taking things away from your patient, you want to have a plan over the course of time to leak these things back in as they feel better over the course of time, right? So we definitely did that. So from a strength training perspective, we took away a heavy gripping, but that got better in around two weeks or so. This guy was a pretty fast responder. Um, he only had to stay away from gripping activities for a couple weeks, and then he naturally got back to them. Um, some patients need a little more handhold help or excuse me, holding. So in some patients you have to say like, Hey, don't do this exercise. And then eventually you have to say, now do this exercise. But most, most patients I find will naturally try it. You know, if it's feeling pretty good, they're going to go back to it in the gym, which I think is fine because I'm, I'm trying to coach patients on how to do their own rehab basically. So they can take care of these problems on their own, right. With minimal help from me. So uh, this patient naturally just found that out over the course of time and started to reincorporate the heavy gripping once it started to feel good, right? Uh, they were back to doing direct arm work in three to four weeks. They found this out on their own and then just started incorporating naturally, which was great. It's easy for me. So when they got getting back to the gym was actually uh, pretty easy. Over the course of three to four weeks, they're pretty much back to everything and they didn't have to worry about much, right? Um, however, tennis was a different story. It took a little bit harder, uh, took a little longer to get back. This makes sense. So from a tendon perspective, generally using um, heavier loads but slower speeds is better tolerated for the tendon. The really, really fast stuff, that elastic stuff is tougher on the tendon. So something like tennis is going to be a little more challenging on a tennis elbow injury than weight training in the gym. So what we did is we, we held off on harder forehands for a little bit, about two weeks, and they actually came back relatively quick. It came back faster than I would have thought, right? That was the initial mechanism of injury, so I thought it would take a little bit longer to get back to that, but it really wasn't. Uh, really ended up being the serving that was the hardest thing to come back. We were actually able to tolerate some lighter serving around the four week mark. And we actually had a return to serve program, right? So I wrote them out a program that said, do X amount of serves this day, X amount of serves this day, X amount of serves this way. And over the course of time, we just increased that, right? So um, it took them about six weeks to get back to harder serving, right? And we didn't just start doing harder serving right away in a competitive environment. We slowly leaked that in. So I had a return to serve program, like I said. And lastly, returning back to serving in competition took around eight weeks, right? So around the eight-week mark, this patient was able to play tennis, serve hard, and feel pretty good. They were still a little bit irritable, right? But they were able to get through everything, and the tendon was getting better over the course of time, okay? So really, it was just a matter of him continuing on the path he's already on to get back to 100%. So... Next natural step, discharge planning, right? And basically, if you've listened to the, you know, the podcast up to this point, like the discharge is actually pretty easy, right? They're getting better. They're feeling good. The lowest of control is in their hands, right? They feel like they're able to continue getting better. They don't necessarily need me. I think it's kind of time to go, right? So I did my discharge planning when he was around 90% improved, right? You can always wait a little longer. You can always go a little bit sooner. His grip strength was back to normal. It was actually a little bit stronger, on his tennis elbow side than the non-involved side or uninvolved side. This makes sense because that was his dominant side anyway, right? So he's getting his strength back where it was prior, probably. His overhead mobility was actually better than the opposite side. 
Um, this was mostly because he didn't do mobility for the contralateral arm, which is hilarious, right? But he actually did get quite a bit better with his overhead mobility. Uh, he was very happy with his progress. He was very happy with me, which is great. You love to see that with your patients. Um, and lastly, like I said, uh, the locus of control was turned over to the patient, right? So the patient felt like they were able to get themselves out of pain and they didn't need me anymore. And I think that's really what you're trying to do. Once the patient feels like they're good and they can be on their own, then you can probably let them be on their own. Okay. And that's what I tend to do with my patients. Could I have held them on to them a little longer? Sure. I could have, um, but I didn't think they needed it. Right. Could I have given them a more comprehensive program so they had less likelihood of getting injured in the future? Yeah, I probably could have. Right. There's a lot of things I could have done. This is just how I tend to like to do my physical therapy. Right. Um, the entirety of physical therapy was around 10 weeks, right? We started off with visits every week, 60 minute sessions. We eventually dropped that down to 30 minute sessions. And towards the very end, we were doing uh, therapy every other week. Okay. So basically once I feel like the patient has met their goals, they're ready to go, right? Um, there may be some different discharge criteria that you have for your patients. This is how I tend to do it with me. All right. And, uh, if you want to learn more, about how to work with individuals with pain and want to get back to the gym, click on this link right here. The learning continues. Thank you guys. I'll see you on the next one.